Hey listeners, a quick note before the start of this episode. I am sad to say that I tripped over my own feet and broke my wrist last week and I need to have surgery. I should be up and running quickly, but there's going to be a short break between this episode and the next one. Let this serve as a reminder to all of us to take life a little more slowly. And in the meantime, thanks so much for your patience. On to this episode. It was consciously starting to try to think about how do I make this speak more, more clearly, more succinctly, and I hope more potently, while still trying to keep things like nuance and thoughtfulness, but how do I make it speak more in the ways that I might speak more if I were speaking, if I were talking about it, and practicing that, practicing that kind of explicitly on the blog. This is Drafting the Past, a podcast devoted to the craft of writing history, and I am your host, Kate Carpenter. For this episode, I spoke with Dr. Benjamin Railton. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Kate. Ben Railton is a historian of American history and culture. He is the author of multiple books, including his two most recent, We the People, The 500-Year Battle Over Who is an American, and Of the I Sing, The Contested History of American Patriotism. Dr. Railton has run the scholarly blog, American Studies, for nearly a dozen years. He also currently has a monthly column for the Saturday Evening Post. I hope you enjoy this conversation about audience, writing, and thinking about how to communicate with your readers. So I just want to dive in by having you tell me a little bit about your path as a writer. Absolutely. And and in thinking about this, this conversation, I've been able to kind of frame the arc that I've been on, I think, in a way that I hadn't before. So I really appreciate the chance mm-hmm. to do that. I knew, kind of generally speaking, that it's been an arc from what I would call academic writing and scholarship to what I would call public writing and scholarship. Broadly speaking, I knew that that's been the arc over the last, let's say, 15 years of, of my life, really my whole time as a, as a professor, as a college educator. But what I've really been able to think about in, in, in thinking about process a little more and in, in preparing to talk to you is, I think there are three pieces to that. There are three elements to that arc, uh, which I would call content, audience, and style. And I, ta- I, I put them in that order because I think that was the order. That's the order that I've kind of moved through with them. And the second and third both took kind of like epiphanies, moments of, of realization, which might be relevant for other people too, in thinking about some of these questions. So from a really early point, I, I had a sense that the content I wanted to write about was maybe not content that academics would necessarily find specific enough or academic enough, maybe, um, but that I was really interested in. Big, broad questions of uh, national identity, collective memory, sort of some of these really big American studies kinds of questions about who we are, who we've been, how we think about ourselves. Even as early as as my second book, which I started working on in 2008, a long time ago now, I was trying to think about those kinds of questions of kind of how we define American identity, these big, big issues. And so the content was sort of already moving in a direction that I think maybe wasn't as much, I mean, not that academics aren't interested in these things, but not at least sort of limited to what I would call academic conversations or spaces, Mm -hmm. but those bigger kinds of public content questions. What I didn't really realize until that second book eventually came out in 2011 was how much audience is a separate question, even in a practical sense. Like that book was published by a publisher who charged $87 for it. That's not a price that any individual reader is ever going to pay, right? That's only for library purchasing. That's only with the idea that like fellow scholars might use it in a library or access it as part of their work. And so I was sort of at the content point, but I wasn't at all yet really at the audience point. Mm -hmm. So that was the second step for me was trying to think about, okay, how do I shift toward writing for and connecting to different audiences. And that really is where online writing came in for me. Starting uh, the blog of mine that I think we'll talk more about in 2010, starting to try to write for other online spaces, really had a lot to do with that idea of trying to find and connect with and engage different audiences, audiences that weren't just say for journal articles or more academically angled publications. But when I look back at those early blog posts, what I wasn't doing at all yet at that second stage was the stylistic shift. I was still Mm. writing like an academic, I would say. Long, long paragraphs, really long, complicated sentences with like, you know, parentheses and semicolons and all sorts of stuff going on that just I don't think was writing that would be engaging as as multiple and broad audiences as I was hoping to engage. It was it was very much my sort of dissertation training writing, what I would call that kind of academic style. And so the third kind of stage that I'm really still in, in a lot of ways, has been really trying to push myself 
to, to change my style, to write in ways that ultimately I think are more me or more how I want to write, but that I had been kind of trained out of from years of, <laughs> of college and grad school and dissertating and, and all the things connected to that. And to write in a style that I would call more genuinely that public scholarly style. So that's the third of the three. Content was kind of always my interest. Audience is where I really started to move toward. But style has been the ongoing question in a lot of ways for me. So blogging since 2010 is it's a long time. And blogging itself has changed a lot in that time. Did you get any pushback? I mean, you work as a professor. Did you get get pushback from colleagues or anything like that when you started blogging? Yeah. I mean, I've been fortunate for sure in the sense that I'm in a, a system, a public university system where things like tenure and promotion, the system of sort of moving through as a, as a faculty member are not dependent on conventional academic publishing. That's just not the way our, uh, the public uh, state university system in Massachusetts works with our contract and so on. You can get, you can move through all those stages with all kinds of different ways of making the case for the work that you've done. So I didn't have to worry about it in that sense. And that's really important to say, because I know for a lot of people, that is one of the questions is, will this be valued by my institution in my processes for my you know, career and, 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 and stability and, and sustaining a career? I think that has started to change, I'll say. I think more and more institutions recognize public scholarship of various kinds as, as legitimate in every sense, including for valuing within an institution or within those processes, although that's a continued question and debate for sure. So I didn't have to worry about that per se. And that was really helpful, I would say. But more broadly, yes, more broadly, I would say for a long time, there was, and perhaps there still is in various ways, a sentiment that A, you know, writing that is not peer reviewed, and then B, online writing in general, and maybe blogging specifically, even because of the name, the idea of like the journal, the log, mm -hmm. the sense that it's like a, a diary or something like that is not only different from, but distinctly less, whatever you want to say, less serious, less thoughtful, less analytical, less valued mm -hmm. in, a lot of, in a lot of spaces. And again, I think that has evolved in, even institutionally, but certainly in 2010, I, I would say that was kind of the conversation. And so I really had to, A, look to models, people who were doing it, who I felt like were doing all those things and doing this thing that I wanted to try to do really well. But then B, it has to start, I think, in our own in our own interests and our own needs. I needed to do it. I wanted to do it. It felt like something really valuable for me. And it's taken a long time, both in the evolution of my own work with it and I would say in our collective conversations, to really then take all the steps I think and I hope that it's it's continued to take. But I started because I really wanted to do it. It felt right. It felt like it was doing some of this this I wanted to do for audience, for my own ideas and interests. And it, it helped keep me writing uh, during all my academic years, too. So it started with me and it stayed there for a while, I would say, and then has gradually, I hope, been part of this larger shift towards some of these other ways of thinking about it. Had you always thought of yourself as a writer? I had, yeah. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, I, I had a typewriter that was a Christmas present and I wrote a, <laughs> a Vietnam War historical novel. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it was only like 80 pages long, but it was a historical novel about the Vietnam War. So yes, I've definitely always been writing. I've always been thinking about writing, trying to write, uh, whether on that typewriter in my bedroom or in all the different settings and spaces. But I think, again, there, there was this interesting divide for a long time where I started with you know that kind of writing, creative writing, personal writing, writing for myself. I loved it. Then I gradually trained into academic writing. And I love that too. I got a lot out of that. I value that a lot, including the dissertation slash first book kind of process, really meaningful for me. But I guess a big part of these last decade or so has been maybe starting to bring those two things together, the like private band and the academic band or scholarly band that that had always felt like maybe even two different kinds of writing, much less two different sides of myself. And now maybe I've started to try to find some ways where that doesn't feel like it's so much a, a divide anymore. And, I'm, and I can write a little more sort of as as myself, maybe my voice, my uh, my my private identity kind of merging a little more with the academic or scholarly side. I want to keep digging into these questions, but I want to go into the practicalities of your writing first. So when and where do you do your writing? So that has evolved interestingly as well um, and, and evolved because of some personal life stuff that is that is its own question. But for a long time, I wrote in libraries, in part because I just I lived in a different town from where my sons were in school, for example. So I would often be at a library in the town where they're in school, uh, waiting to pick them up or spending the day when I wasn't going into Fitchburg. And so a big place that was a central presence for like 
books two through five, let's say, among other things, was uh, the public library um, here in the town of Massachusetts, where I now live and, and where they have been for a long time. And so that space is really defining for me. And I think it's really actually, it was really important because so much of my moving into this more fully developed writing career was about balancing that with all the other parts of my job and life. Um, including all the parts of being a faculty member at a place with a 4-4 teaching load and all the service that's part of it and all of that work and balancing being a dad for sure. And so that library was a space that was kind of like related to those different sides, but also was separate from either of them and where I could sort of, I think, carve out a little bit of that, that part of me, that voice. And so I really just want to give props. I'll say it's the Needham Public Library here in Needham, Massachusetts. And you know, I got to know the librarians there and I had like a table that was my table a lot of the time when I could get it. And, and then I would, you know, I I would write, especially in the mornings, if I could be there then, because then all the high schoolers would come in in the afternoon and it would be a whole different vibe. And maybe (laughs) I'd, you know, write blog posts in the afternoon, for example, but I, you know, maybe not the ongoing book project or whatever. So that space was really, really instrumental. and, And I'll always have this kind of sense of it as part of that whole transition that I was talking about and part of that whole building of, of all the parts of my writing. But then, since I've moved back to this town myself, this uh, the place where I am right now, which is only going to be an audio, I know, but it, it is the place I write, which is my, my comfy chair in my living room, in my home. And I think maybe as I've gotten comfortable enough with pulling all those threads together, even just like psychologically, I've been able, I, I wasn't able to write at home originally. I just wasn't. It was a thing I couldn't really do at first, but now I really am. And it's really the space where the last couple projects and ongoing stuff tends to happen most of the time. Occasionally, I'll, I'll get something done you know, while I'm at the office at at Fitchburg State where I teach or in other settings. But for the most part now, it's something that has become able to be part of like my home space and this particular particular corner of that. What's your approach to projects? Do you sort of conceive of bigger projects and then dive into them? Or do you pick up pieces as you go and then realize that you have a project in the works? Definitely more the latter um, for the last few. And I think that there are practical reasons for that, again, including time and, and schedule and balance. But the main reason for that is how much at least the last few book projects and the current one I'm writing, but probably even one or two before that, came out of the blog and came out of online writing. They started with, well, in the classroom, actually. They started with moments or ideas or small individual topics or conversations in a classroom, in my own thinking on the blog, that then would start to feel connected to other things and start to feel in conversation with other things. And and again, often in, in classroom settings, you know, conversation about author X and then a different text a month later would would start to, to gel a little, but also across threads of blog posts or threads of, of subtopics there. That's really how it has developed for me is pulling together kind of a couple pieces with, again, I think maybe that also relates to this idea of the more public topics, synthesis kind of as the ultimate goal, right? That these aren't things that are just part of like one moment or one history or one author. So they aren't maybe able for me anyway to be conceptualized kind of initially in the whole because they're not, they don't work that way. But so I'll say, okay, you know, there's this experience that, that a lot of Equiano had and that, that Gloria Anzaldúa writes about in her book. And we talked about it in these two different classes, but now I think they kind of are a shared sort of American experience that turns into my book on redefining American identity. Or I'm thinking about, you know, examples of patriotism in a, a blog series in 2015 and then 2019. And then I say, wait a sec, there's a thread there that maybe is a project about patriotism and how we define it. So yeah, these kind of multiple little moments that then are I'm hoping to synthesize into these bigger frames. That's a lot of how it's developed for me. When you say that the past few books and the one you're working on now have emerged out of the blog, there's that element of sort of ideas coming together and being synthesized. But how does that then happen practically? Do you create a proposal as you see those coming out? Or Yeah, interestingly, a lot of it for me has also been as I have evolved in my relationship to publishing and, and, and getting my voice out there. So for example, that second book I had mentioned, which was too expensive, but otherwise I liked the press a lot, was with Paul Grave McMillan, that press. And then they developed a series. I'm not sure if it's ongoing, but there are others like it called Pivot, which are these like shorter print on demand designed for more public access publications. And that series gelled with some things I had been pulling together for my third book, which I knew was going to be shorter and focused. And it was like this perfect fit with a publisher I already knew, but something different that they were doing. Then shifted gears to Roman and Littlefield for my next couple projects. And Roman and Littlefield has this series called American Ways, which is this wonderful series sort of asking big like national kinds of questions and bigger public kind of topics. 
And the existence of that series and the kind of stuff I was starting to think about is what allowed me to pull things together for proposals for that series for both We the People and Of The I Sing, which I don't know that I would have conceptualized as much as I was able to if the series weren't there to kind of help me think about, okay, these are these American ways questions. These are these defining mm -hmm. national questions. And then now I'm at a place with the current project I'm working on where I have an agent. I'm working with an agent named Susie Evans, um, a wonderful agent who, who works a lot in this kind of bridging of, let's say, academic to public scholarly work for folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so working with her has allowed me to then take a step back and think about, okay, this is a different kind of proposal. This is a different kind of project where I'm pulling some different threads together that I'd already been thinking about. But how do I do that in a proposal for, you know, for mass market publishers, for that broader sphere, working with an agent? So it's been a few stages where each of them is the relationship, I guess, between my own evolving writing and voice, but also these different publishers and these different like places and ways to get work out there and how I'm trying to kind of navigate the relationship of those two things anyway. Could you talk a little bit about how you organize your research, especially, I mean, you have so much going on all the time that I find uh, research organization sort of overwhelming in the simplest ways. And you, you have a lot of balls in the air. Sure. And what I'm about to say may be probably something people will respond to uh, with terror, which maybe they should, because it's all like digitized. It's all like saved on computers or in documents. I very little that's ever sort of handwritten. And so if and when that all like goes away somehow, I'm, I'm toast. Um, I mean, it's backed up in various forms, but nonetheless, I should probably try to have hard copy versions of things more than I do. Because for me, so much is maybe because of all those balls in the air, so much comes through Word documents and digital versions of all the past writing I've done. You know, my blog is all in multiple Word documents that are saved in multiple places. And all my other online writing is saved in multiple places. And so it sort of builds up out of there. And then I can you know, try to go back into those and pull things that, that I then can move into, you know, here are ideas for this possible next project that then could, you know, could become maybe the proposal for it. Or here are threads. I mean, another place I do a lot of this just to say is in adult education. I teach at least two adult ed classes every semester in a couple different programs that I really love. And those are often places where I'm like testing these things, starting to pull the threads together in a, in a class um, that'll, you know, they're five week classes or so. So pull together a five week class on patriotism or on exclusion and inclusion. And, um, and so that I'll have like, you know, documents where I'm planning out those adult ed classes. And those are spaces where I'm pulling from some of these different threads and sort of moving them into that other place. Um, and then accessing different sources, you know, to try to learn more about it, to teach it, to write posts about it, to write online stuff about it. And so a lot of it is just sort of moving between, I guess, these different planning sort of digital spaces and documents to pull on these threads. And then eventually hoping to sort of pull that together more fully into kind of a more coherent whole. I guess that's a lot of how I'm building up. And and over the last few years, so much of what I'm finding, just to say, is through digitized materials, right? I haven't been able even before pandemic time, I haven't been able to travel very much with the boys as my main focus. So it, I, I just rely so much on the sources side as well as the writing side mm -hmm. on the digital, on what's out there digitally. And again, I'm, you know, there are limits to that. And I, I, I'd love to get back to a point where I can travel more or try to get more into archives of other kinds as well. But both for my own work and for what's out there, I've really relied and loved how much is now digitally available and possible and, and connected. And that's been a huge um, saving grace of being able to do all this work for me for at least this last decade. How do you keep these things? I don't want to say balanced because that's a loaded word, <laughs> but keep them all going. I mean, you write, you write so much, you teach a lot, and you also have two boys. And I know that you are an active and generous <laughs> Twitter user who seems generally to be in a good mood, at least <laughs> in your digital presence. How do you handle all of that? Well, thank you. First of all, it is. Um, I mean, it's all you know. It's all choices and work, right? None of that is is just necessarily the case, including mood, right? It is it is about, you know, not obviously 100% of the time by any means, but trying to choose to remain focused on things like solidarity and community and and critical optimism and and doing the work, um, whatever the work is, and, and, and including the very real work, of course, of parenting and and of teaching and faculty and and scholarship and everything else. But the other thing that I would say beyond just trying hard to keep you know, choosing it and, and, and being in it and being inspired by so many other people doing the same. The other thing that definitely was the saving grace for me in terms of balance, which is an important word, if a, a fraught one, has been online writing. I'll just say that really clearly. And I make the case for that as much as I can to people that 
particularly if you're try if you're teaching at a teaching intensive institution, for example, and you're hoping to maintain a writing and scholarly voice and and projects and work. For me, when I look back, that was the pivot point between really not being able to do it consistently mm -hmm. and starting to figure out how to do it consistently was 2010, 2011, when I started blogging. Um, you know, I published a book in 2007, the second one in 2011. And then since then, and, and that about 10 years, four. And the difference was online writing. The difference was the starting point that that was always present in my life, that I don't blog every day. I write them in batches and schedule them. But I see it every day. I share it every day. I connect back to it every day. It's always there for me. It's always a reminder of this other side of my voice and work that is parallel to but different from the classroom or parenting or service or whatever else. So online writing for me is what allowed it to become a consistent part of my life and work rather than like just during summers or spring break or trying to figure out how and when to fit in things like writing and scholarship. And I think it's helped with balance in all the other ways, too, because it just helps me create that sense that. I do have a lot of balls in the air, but they are consistently in the air. And I'm trying to figure out how to be those different sides of me rather than just sort of turning something off for a long time and trying to reconnect to it, which is what I, the first few years at Fitchburg State, that's what I would do. I would not really write at all until at least like spring break, maybe winter break, really the summer. And then when it would take a month to turn that back on and I wouldn't really be able to get anything going. And so now I just have that sense that all the sides of me, I guess, are, are complicatedly, but definitely present. And I can, can keep them in mind, at least on a day to day basis, and then be dipping into them a little more fully, rather than trying to just restart the engine, which was so difficult to do so much of the time. Yeah, one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about was how with so much writing, how you keep sort of creativity and motivation going and refreshed. And it sounds like for you, part of that is just staying in touch with with the work. Absolutely it is. And then also thinking about it. And again, I don't want to say there's one version of this. Of course there isn't, but thinking of it as a schedule kind of thing. So like I, if my blog weren't daily, and again, I don't write it daily, but I do create it you know, with this goal of these daily posts. Mm -hmm. I would have stopped doing it a long time ago. If I said like, I'll try to do it once a month or something, I, I, it just wouldn't, for me, it wouldn't have worked. I had to have the sense that I'm at least planning it and, 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 and scheduling it and seeing it in that, that really consistently scheduled way. And the same with like Saturday evening post columns, which are twice a month. So twice a month, I have to sit down and think, what do I want to do for this column? What do I want to write about this time? And that does force me, but also help me to be creating or creative or, or coming up with ideas. And um, sometimes they're quicker or sometimes it takes longer, more difficult, whatever. But I'm always in that space as a part of my schedule, as a part of my day to day. And and again, then the other parts feed into that where stuff will happen in class that'll then help me think of things because it's kind of on the radar. Or, I mean, my most recent post was about the boys and their educational experiences because we've been talking about that stuff. And, but it's, I think it's because I've got the balls in the air, complicated as that can be, that it allows me to then sort of be trying to think about them creatively when those moments come and, and make it more consistently present. So that's, it, it is very much that, that, that intersection of things, I would say. How does editing and revision fit into this for you? And what does your editing process look like? Yeah, it's a good question. And it's a question I have to be really conscious of with book projects, because truthfully, with either blog posts or like other online writing, like the Saturday Evening Post columns, there's very minimal revision that I do. I'll get feedback on the columns from my editor at the Post, who's wonderful. Jennifer Bortel is awesome. So she'll give me feedback. And I edit in response to her feedback almost every column. That happens for sure. But with my own writing, with those kinds of online pieces of writing, there's not a lot of editing and revision. There's not time or space, and it's not really how that genre works, I would say. And that's fine. I think that is what it is. And that makes it the kind of experimental starting point, shorter form, building block for other things that it can be. But obviously, that's very different when it comes to book projects. Um, and particularly like this newest one, where I'm trying a really different style again, this more like narrative storytelling public style that I'm kind of trying to move into. I have to be really conscious that it is that different kind of process where I do have to be really taking a step back and creating space in that balance of things for not just the writing or the planning or the drafting or whatever, but for revision and editing as a separate thing. Mm -hmm. Because for me anyway, maybe in part because of how all that other stuff has developed, it doesn't just happen sort of concurrently and it doesn't happen as, as maybe instinctively as perhaps with my dissertation it did, let's say. I'm in a different place, so I have to bring myself to a point where it becomes part of the work more fully. And that's a work in progress for me because again, it hasn't been so much with a lot of the online writing. So I think this will be a really good you know, chance to try to exercise that muscle a lot more. 
I talk about it with my students all the time, but I haven't exercised it as much myself. I mean, the book projects have had revision and editing to be sure, but this one's going to take more. I think it is going to take more to really consciously turn it into what I want it to be. So I'm excited to, to kind of force myself to get back into that as a consistent thing, not just like for a couple of weeks when the edits come in, but as a consistent part of the process all along. So it hasn't been maybe as consistent as it, as it could have been. There have been good reasons for that, but it's time to get back to it at least. To get Dr. Railton to talk about how he thinks about his writing and his voice, I asked him to talk to me about a paragraph from the conclusion of his most recent book, Of the Icing. Here's the paragraph. Ultimately, I believe that's one of the most consistent goals of all active and critical patriotic efforts, and has certainly been my goal in tracing them throughout these chapters, to make clear that American patriotism has always been a contested space, containing multiple forms and perspectives, There certainly remains a significant place for a celebratory patriotic perspective, for national narratives that highlight our ideals and the best of who we are. It's vital, however, to acknowledge and resist the ease with which national celebrations can turn into mythic patriotisms, often precisely by defining criticism of the nation as un- and even anti-American. Such exclusionary definitions of patriotism as of the nation itself don't just leave out other perspectives and communities. They assume consensus when in fact there is debate, making it that much more difficult for alternative voices and views to be heard and included in our conversations and society. This paragraph comes from the end of of the I Sing. I often choose paragraphs toward the beginning of books because they are interesting stage setting, but this one I was really interested in because You do such a great job here of sort of summing up your argument, really making sure readers know what you want them to take away from the book. And it's in this really strong voice that is very much not an academic voice, but is much more conversational. So could you talk me through a little bit what you're thinking when you create a paragraph like this, how you try to achieve a voice like that? Absolutely. And and again, it's this interesting blend, I would say, because on one level, I think that voice is a kind of organic part of me. I think my sons might call it my teaching voice, the voice that starts to come out when I'm, I mean, a lot of my teaching is discussion-based, but the parts where I'm talking, the parts where I'm, you know, doing a little mini lecture at the start of a class or following up something we've been talking about, I think that is is a kind of organic part of that teaching voice anyway, which maybe was always in there. Maybe it's part of why we gravitate toward that profession, but maybe I've also obviously developed it over 20 years of college teaching. That voice where you are trying to be, hopefully, you know, conversational, not on high, not separate from the, the community you're talking with, and yet making your points and trying to make them as clearly and as potently as you can to, to be heard and to have it have some meaning to that audience. So I think partly it's that. It's a voice that is a kind of organic, at least for many decades now, part of me. But turning it into writing was definitely not organic, at least not for a long time. Again, that was even really that third stage of the move from like the public content to the public audience to the public style, as mm-hmm. I would describe it. Even if it was in there and in, in my teaching and in maybe even if I just you know get passionate about a topic in talking about it with my sons or with whoever, it wasn't in my writing, at least not in any of the ways that, that I hope it is now in, in a, a project like that and in a moment like what you're mentioning. And so what really, again, there's two things I would say about that. One was online writing, but not initially. When I look at the first year or two of the blog, I wasn't doing that. And so it was consciously starting to try to think about how do I make this speak more, more clearly, more succinctly, and I hope more potently, while still trying to keep things like nuance and thoughtfulness, but how do I make it speak more in the ways that I might speak more if I were speaking, if I were talking about it, and practicing that, practicing that kind of explicitly on the blog in a variety of ways, including shorter paragraphs, shorter sentences, um, and just thinking about it as a, a set of choices, as a style. So that was one piece of it. But then definitely the other piece was online writing for outside audiences, mm-hmm. including editors at those outside audiences who, who pushed back, who would say, you know, this is still not clear enough or, you know, this is this feels too academic or you know, whatever the case may be at the uh, Talking Points Memo, at the Saturday Evening Post, the Huff Post, these various spaces. I've gotten great pushback, great response. That has forced me and helped me. Or for a while, I, I on the website salon.com, I had a, a mirror of the blog. Uh, they had a thing called Open Salon where you could like you know mirror your own writing there. And mm-hmm. commenters there would all the time say like this is too this is too dense. I don't know what you're trying to say here. 
So just pushback, pushback from outside audiences in those different online writing kind of spaces was really helpful for me to then, as I'm writing now, it's become a little more natural in writing to parallel the natural side of it in my, my voice or my speaking or my teaching. But I still think about it all the time. I'm still really consciously saying in a moment like that, what do I most want to say? What do I most want to communicate? What are those takeaways, as you mentioned? And how can I try to craft writing that I hope, you know, is, is you know, lyrical enough, but that also is succinct and communicating? Mm -hmm. The balance of what I hope, you know, is readable and engaging, you know, not just like a, you know, a treatise, a political document, but at the same time that gets what I want to get in there and there. And it is that that crafting that I'm trying to do. for sure. Do you have a writing community that you rely on for feedback as you're working on something like this? Or is that is that a role that your online community plays? Yeah, at times I have in person or in, in settings beyond the online. And the online has definitely been there for a long time and more and more as I've been able to connect more and more to to folks on Twitter, to fellow, you know, online writers, to different sides. So the online community for sure. And that has built and I and I love it and I value it. And this is one example of of those kinds of connections for sure. But but yeah, I have at times in meaningful ways that that I think with this project I I, I will need to get back to. So for example, we had a writing group at Fitchburg State for a long time of uh, the faculty who were trying to do this scholarly work in various forms, some in my English studies department, but across other departments as well. And we would share, you know, works in progress, bits of things with each other and read them and talk about them. That was hugely important, um, again, as part of even this transition process for me, getting their feedback and their thoughts. And then I have a couple other, you know, friends from grad school or from other times who've been, you know, informal parts of that in both directions um, between ourselves for a while. But I've gotten away from that, maybe in part because the online has been such a great community for these last couple of years, especially. But I do think I need to revisit that because it just offers different kinds of conversation and again, pushback or feedback that I think will be really important to not lose sight of for something like this current work. So I have at times, I've, I've it's been mostly online for a while, but I'd love to try to keep building that. And I think everybody can benefit from just multiple kinds of feedback and conversation around the work that we're doing for sure. It sounds too like your work in teaching plays a big role in helping you think through how, how you're explaining things and how your voice is coming across. Do you also think about how to teach writing to your students? That's a great question because I do. I think a lot about the direction of the teaching toward my writing. Um, absolutely think about that all the time. And again, that's been a central truth of how things have developed and gone. But the other direction, yeah, I think it really has. And sometimes it's in particular settings. Like I'm teaching a class right now that's a, a kind of senior seminar level class in our department where you focus on one author. And, and for this class, we're doing uh, W.E.B. Du Bois as our focal author. It's the second time I've taught him as the center of this class, but the first was 2013. And so this time I'm a lot more thinking about all these things than I was nine years ago. And so I am very consciously in that class talking to them all the time about themselves as writers and as potentially public writers like Du Bois was or creative writers when we read his creative writing or journalists. And so that's a class specifically where all the time I'm trying to bridge that gap and talk about my experience with it, Du Bois is with it, and all of them as part of that kind of community and as moving in that continued direction. But then on a broader level, yeah, I think, for example, in the last decade, I have almost entirely stopped worrying about teaching or focusing or giving feeds, feedback or grades on things like grammar usage stuff, even in my first year writing classes that I teach a couple of most semesters. You know, that's a complicated thing to choose to do. And I know a lot of my colleagues and other audiences care a lot about that kind of stuff. So I try to make sure students are aware of it or think about it. But I think so much of it for me has come down to the idea of, I want them to develop their voices. I want them to develop their style, their ideas, their engagement with these kind of conversations. And I think grammar, for example, can get in the way of that. If you're worried so much about like, you know, is this a comma place? it's a lot harder to be thinking about like, what do I have to say? And how can I try to really develop my voice through this work? So I think that increased shift for me in teaching writing, even in first year writing classes and in lit classes of all types has paralleled my own sense of that goal of you know, setting aside maybe some of like the expectations or the academic frames of things or the formal frames of things and saying, how do we say what we want to say? And how do we make our voice speak and communicate with nuance, but also with, with clarity and, and with, with us in there, with our voice really in there. And that has, I think, really affected the way that I teach writing and, and, and teach in general. And I hope, I hope can feel you know, meaningful to every individual student as well as to the communities that we're part of. I'd like to talk a little bit about inspiration. 
So who do you read? Who do you turn to as models in writing or as, as ways to get you thinking about craft? And when you asked that or mentioned that as a question, it was really helpful for me because I was able to sort of take a step back and, and ask myself that because I know, I mean, I know I'm inspired sort of day in and day out by like the Twitter storians community and voices on Twitter and the solidarity there and by my colleagues and my students, like I, and by my sons, I mean, I have a whole range of inspirations, but to think a little more specifically about, you know, writing inspirations. And I, and I, I broke it down into three, into three categories because I tend to think structurally, I guess. <laughs> I certainly write structurally. And so one of them was the, you know, the, 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 just one example I'll give of sort of the earliest voices that, again, on the content level, for example, were like, yeah, that's the kind of question I want to be asking. And a really great example of that was this historian named Michael Kamen. I think that's how you pronounce it, K-A-M-E-N, um, who had this book called Mystic Chords of Memory, mm -hmm. which is about like tradition and commemoration and memory and history in America. And it's huge. It's like 700 pages long, but it's so accessible, so publicly written so wide in scope, covering so much, and then in depth in different individual moments. And I read that, I think in college first, but then returned to it in grad school really fully. And it just sort of was like, yes, this is the kind of writing I'd love to do. And I couldn't yet sort of for my dissertation exactly, that's not how that goes a lot of the time. So it took me a while, as I said, to kind of get back to that, let's say. But from an early point, there were these, these folks who, who were doing work where I just felt like, yeah, that kind of question, that kind of content, and the writing that can connect to it, and he wrote other great stuff too, including a book about the Constitution. But that book in particular, Mystic Chords of Memory, was one that just was doing that for me so potently. The second category I wanted to mention were when I was moving into online writing, people who were doing that too. And again, who really helped show me how it could be done and, and helped me feel that it could, that it was a possibility. And so just three people I'll mention because they're all really great inspirations to me and continue to be. The most direct was a guy who I ended up becoming friends with because he lived in Massachusetts and in the same town eventually that I lived in, but who um, who had a daily blog that really inspired my own or as I was starting my own. It was called the American Literary Blog. Um, his name is Rob Villela. Um, he has since moved on from that blog, but he does other um, kind of public scholarly stuff, especially around performance of different authors and identities. But that daily blog, the American Literary Blog of Rob Villela's was a huge inspiration to me. Kevin uh, Levin um, and his Civil War memory site and blog, which was a few years old already when I started and continues to, to go and be really awesome, was a great, great inspiration for me for the idea of like a site beyond just the daily blog and creating a kind of space for online writing. And then the, the most public of the three at the time was uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates and the way that he used his blog on the Atlantic, which was kind of the first place where I saw like a community all of his commenters, all the people who would guest post for him, whose voices he would share, building up this community of like public scholarly blogging and writing through that Atlantic blog that he maintained really before he then got into all his books and all his other work, mm -hmm. but also the community that was being built there. So those three were huge in that stage in that category of kind of online writing. And then today, I would say a couple of things. I would say there are individuals who continue to model all those things for me. And the one, and I know I'm not alone in this, but it's still true, um, Heather Cox Richardson, the way that she pulls together daily writing, public scholarly writing, still working on book projects, and an online presence, and a kind of support for all of us online so fully, and teaching, and you know, still working as a, as a professor as well. Amazing inspiration for all the work that I'm still trying to do through what, what she's doing, and, and a lot of other figures, um, but she's an example. But then the other thing that I would say beyond, let's say, the Twitter community is how much I, I see this work now as happening collectively. So you've got like the Made by History blog on Washington Post or the Black Perspectives blog that the African-American Intellectual Historical Society folks maintain or the, uh, the U.S. Intellectual History blog that people like L.D. Burnett and Sarah Giorgini and others have helped maintain. These collective spaces of like public scholarly writing. I think that's what really inspires me day to day these days because it's just a reflection that we're not in this by ourselves, that there is that, that shared effort that I'm trying to be part of in one way or another too. So there's been individuals all along the way, but now more and more, it is this idea of these collective conversations, I would say. What draws you to thinking about your work as a public historian? Why is that important to you? It's a really good question. Um, I think it starts in part by seeing myself as American studies, as interdisciplinary. And even though I've come through different sort of kinds of training and English PhD program and so on, I've always had that as, as the kind of core definition of myself is as American studies, as kind of interdisciplinary, as pulling together. And I think that in and of itself, it is a, a discipline and it has academic departments and so on. 
But I think it is a little bit less defined by sort of academic categorization and thus maybe by academic sort of expectations or spaces or journals or whatever. So I think kind of all along that's been a, a factor in it is the idea that something like American studies is about these public questions and these 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 pulling together of things, synthesizing and 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 doing work that is maybe not seen even as conventionally sort of one academic thing. And and I, I like that. I value that. So so that's been in there all along. But then the other way that it really happened was in response to things I saw happening publicly. So like I started my blog in November 2010. I think like a week after the 2010 midterm elections. Mm. And it wasn't just that the midterm elections went the way they did as this, you know, seeming rebuke of the Obama administration, and, but it was the voices that I saw driving that moment. So one voice, for example, was Glenn Beck, the right-wing radio host and TV host and commentator. He had a thing at the time called Beck University, which was this fake, not accredited, but very definite thing where students, people could take classes on things like American history. Um, for example, and it was hugely popular as he was at that time. And I really connected that to what I saw happening in the political sphere, where I saw voices doing what looked like scholarly work. Uh, Bill O'Reilly was starting to publish all his books at that time, for example, as well. Beck had that whole setting in space. But I felt, A, that it was work that obviously had views of things like America that I disagreed with as most as powerfully as I could disagree with anything. But B, that they were the only ones doing that work publicly. There were mm -hmm. no voices coming from any other segments or sectors or perspectives. And I'm not even just talking just political, the political spectrum, but of say people who were in, in you know, faculty roles or academic settings or educational spaces. I felt like there was a large gap there and it was being filled by this one kind of, I would say propagandistic scholarship. And so I just said, if I'm going to keep doing this work for the rest of my career, I want it to feel like it's intervening a little bit in those conversations. And that was a big part of, of thinking about online, thinking about that public audience and thinking about just what I wanted to do for the rest of my career was to try to join those conversations and offer something different from what I saw so much of the dominating voices at that time still being defined by. What advice would you give for historians, especially maybe younger historians, but, but any historians? interested in writing for a more public audience, but especially doing so by writing more online? I mean, the first thing is just do it. Just start doing it again. Um, and I do it in the most basic way. I mean, Blogspot is this free, you know, there, it's very bare bones. I know there are much fancier ways to do it. And that there's value to those in different ways, of course. But I think to start, just, just get it going. Um, and, and get it going knowing, again, that it starts for you. It's not going to find audience immediately, but mine certainly didn't for a long time other than like my parents and occasional friends or, you know, really nice colleagues who read it every day. So start for you, start doing it, make it regular, make it consistent, whatever the schedule looks like exactly. And just treat it as what it is, which is experimental, creative, open space to try to think about what you want to think about and write in a way that first, again, is your practice with it. But then I guess I would also say as quickly as possible, and it took me a while, think of the goal of connecting to audience, even if you're still working on how to get there so that you can really consciously treat the work that way as how do I want to communicate and how do I want to say what I want to say and, and you know, and, and, and get to an audience and what would they find here and, you know, what would keep them coming back and, and interest them and connect with them. Um, and that doesn't mean any one topic, I don't think, or even certainly any one style, but just having those questions in mind, doing it for me, but also if it's going to get to an audience, what do I want that to mean and look like? And then I think with those two starting points, what's really great right now is there's so many of us who are going to help share it right? When it's out there, when it's shared, when you post it on social media or share it in other forums, um, there's a lot of us who are going to really want to help build you into that conversation because that's, I think, what, what we all want is as multivocal a conversation as we can get and as many folks doing this work and, and, and being shared as possible. So, so start it, start it for you, think about how to share it with audience, but then I hope you know, get it to us, get it out there, get it into the world and let the kind of communities that are so vibrant now and so inspiring, as I said, help it become a genuine part of that conversation. Are you willing to share a little bit about work, what you're working on for the next book? Absolutely. And I, and I appreciate you asking. So yeah, this is the first time I'm really, you know, from the start saying, A, I want this to try to be a mass market publication. I want it to be on that front table at Barnes & Noble. I want to think of it as a book in that, in that vein. And then B, along with that, and it, wouldn't always maybe come along with that, but it is for me, 
that it's really narrative driven, that it's driven by stories. You know, I've always tried to have stories in, in the work, at least for the last few projects, but they've been driven, I think, by sort of big ideas or concepts. And this is the opposite. This is driven by stories that I hope open up to some really big, important stuff. And specifically, there's one story I've been trying to, to make the center of, pro of a project for a long time, which is the story of this baseball team featuring students at the Chinese Educational Mission, which is a school in Hartford of the 1870s founded by this awesome guy, Young Wing, featuring eventually 120 uh, Chinese American young men, a group of whom form a baseball team in the semi-pro New England leagues of the 1870s called the Celestials, and who end up, once the school has to close in the exclusion era, they travel across the country, they're being forced to leave their new home, they end up in San Francisco, and they're challenged to a, a game by an Oakland baseball team, and they play this one final baseball game and win this one final baseball game and then have to leave the U.S. Oh, wow. And that's just like my favorite American story, and I've known forever that I want it. I've, I've, I've featured it in, in little parts of other projects along the way. And I've thought, is it like a screenplay? Is it a novel? Is it whatever? I've had all these different thoughts about it. But what opened up finally this project for me is, so that game is played presumably in a, something I would call a sandlot. There are no stadiums yet in San Francisco in the 1870s for baseball. So something like a sandlot is where that game happens. In, and that game is 1881 specifically. In the late 1870s in San Francisco, there's a space called The Sandlot, capital S. It's this big open space next to City Hall where this guy named Dennis Kearney, this Irish-American immigrant, worker, labor leader, becomes the leading voice of anti-Chinese sentiment in, in America, eventually, first in San Francisco, then in California, then in America, with these speeches that he delivers in the Sandlot in 1870s San Francisco. But his story is also incredibly complicated and, and, and interesting, including taking part in a group who were resisting or fighting back against an anti-Chinese massacre earlier in 1877 in San Francisco, the same year that he ends up starting to give these speeches. So his journey as an immigrant, as a labor activist, and eventually as this leading voice for anti-Chinese narratives in the U.S. is incredibly complicated and it really, I think, telling an important American story. And so then the title of the book is Two Sandlots, uh, Baseball Bigotry and the Battle for America. So thinking about like those two spaces, those two stories, that both kind of lead to these sandlots in San Francisco in 1870s, 1880, but that open up, I, I hope, to so much more as well in, in these longer histories and stories. So that's what I'm working on right now. That sounds great. Looking forward to it. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks again to Dr. Benjamin Railton for joining me for this episode of Drafting the Past. This was an excellent conversation about writing and thinking about your audience. As always, thanks to my listeners for tuning in. You can find links to all of Dr. Railton's books and everything we talked about in this week's episode at draftingthepast.com. Find me on Twitter at draftingthepast. And until next time, happy writing and watch your feet. <laughs>